As Rob said, um, I've been consulting at Kuta Mundra since 1978, and uh, during that time I've seen actually quite a few, quite a few changes in, in farming systems, and uh, it's the economics and risk of these farming systems which um, has particular interest for me. The situation is that uh, over that period of time, I've seen farmers actually faced with highly variable crop yields which are trending down, mainly due to decreasing growing season and available moisture, growing season rainfall, sorry, and available moisture. During that period of time, the quantity and cost of their crop inputs, particularly herbicides and nitrogen fertiliser, has increased despite the decreasing yields. The production and financial risk profile of those farm businesses has therefore increased as a result of decreasing crop yields and the cost of production has been steadily increasing during that period of time. My work has shown that a crop production system involving brown manure legume crops has lower input and production and operating costs. It can be as profitable as continuous cropping because it has less production and financial risk compared to continuous cropping. Now, 30 years ago, the typical farm use uh, in southern New South Wales was about 30% uh, cropping and 70% grazing. And a lot of those properties now, as they've expanded, uh, because of um, economies of scale, etc., the have expanded the cropping enterprises rather than the livestock enterprises, which has made sense to a, to a large extent. However, those businesses as a result have now taken on a much higher risk profile than what they had previously. The livestock are relatively low risk, but low return. But it's the classic risk reward equation, where the potentially higher returns, you're guaranteed to actually have higher risk. So let's just have a look at some yield data that uh, I've collected um, from clients over the years. This is from the period 1986. Um, 87 to 2013-14, it's a 28 year period for which I actually have reliable data. This is average farm data reconciled to delivery dockets. It's not the best paddock on the farm or the, the paddock that they talk about at the pub. It's average farm wheat yields over that period. Now I've looked at, looked at this over a number of clients over about a 200 kilometre, radi a kilometre uh, distance from Lockhart to West Wyalong and the picture is pretty much the same. We're seeing declining yields over that period of time. Oops, sorry. Um, so back here, um, we're looking at about four tonne a hectare and coming down here to you know, less, than, less than three tonne a hectare over that period of time. But if we have actually a look at uh, available moisture, and I defined available moisture as growing season rainfall, less than 110 mils, plus 30 per cent of November to March rainfall, you can see that that's declining as well. So you can see decline from 86 down to 2013. We have a look at matching the yield to the available moisture. We can see a very close fit. Those with a keen eye will see that the downward slope of crop yield is actually less than the downward slope of rainfall because it's been a slight slight increase in water use efficiency over that period of time. However, there's still a lot of variation in this from 4 to 16 kilograms a millimetre rainfall during that period of time. So it's an interesting historical data, but not very useful for planning on how, what your likely yield is going to be from this time of the year, because you don't know whether your water use efficiency is going to be 4 or 14. So this creates tremendous risk to a farm business looking at how they're actually going to operate. So as a result of this, I'm actually very doubtful about the sustainability of continuous cropping that has been adopted in this region. It basically, it's been based on canola and wheat because the grain legumes uh, the market for the traditional grain legumes, field peas and lupins, is quite small and so on any significant scale 
uh, canola has really been the only one that has actually had um, you know, had a market that you can always sell into, and and so we've seen rotations of canola wheat, canola wheat, or canola wheat wheat uh, developed. But if you go back to look at the yields um, back here, I mean it's a bit like I think farming's really just like a widget factory, and I liken it really to if you had a widget factory in Moorabbin in Melbourne and um, you went to a banker in Burke Street and you're describing your business and you said, well, back here we used to bring a semi-load of inputs in a week and we used to turn out 100 widgets. Now we bring in a B-double of inputs and we turn out 75 widgets a week. What do you reckon you'd think about your business model? How sustainable was it? But that's what we're doing in farming. So how sustainable is it? So I've been looking at alternatives to this high input canola wheat, canola wheat, or canola wheat, wheat system to see whether we can actually get back to basics, reduce the input levels, particularly of herbicides and nitrogen, to actually come up with a lower risk business model. The transformation from mixed farming to continuous cropping has been associated with zero till, stubble retention, and in terms of weeds, all the things that you wouldn't do if you actually wanted to stay on top of grass weeds, people have done. Widen their row spacing, stop burning, stop using pre-emergent herbicides, or if they have, they're less efficacious because of the straw. So um, grass weed problems, particularly rye grass and wild oats, have increased, not surprisingly. And just you know, waiting for the next silver bullet and uh, spending lots of money on herbicide, just I don't believe is sustainable because at some stage you're going to hit a brick wall and we've seen businesses actually do that. Okay. So brown manure legume crops provide three major benefits over long fallowing. Competition for weeds, accumulation of soil nitrogen and maintenance of ground cover. So really when you're looking at the economics of this, you're actually not comparing, not comparing the brown manure system with another crop, you're actually comparing it with a, with a long fallow because that's really the other alternative to get on top of uh, problem weeds and to actually give the country a spell. I believe a brown manure legume system is likely more sustainable than continuous cropping because of the less reliance on nitrogen, uh, brought in nitrogen and uh, selective herbicides. It maintains higher levels of ground cover and therefore we can actually carry some moisture over from the non-crop period to the next crop. The crop sequences uh, I've been looking at is actually growing canola after the brown manure legume crop. Um, this enables almost complete prevention of wild oat and ryegrass seed set for two years in a row, which basically reduces the seed set to uh, the seed bank to negligible levels. We also had increasing problems with crown rot in the continuous cropping system, with only one year break between cereals and a two year break uh, between two uh, with two uh, broadleaf crops seems to give us some control of that. Also seeing a uh, much lower reduction of take-all levels, although take-all hasn't actually been a problem in recent years because there have been dry winters and springs. But in the wetter springs when take-all uh, raises its uh, ugly head, uh, the double break actually gives us uh, more control of that. We're also seeing reduction in yellow leaf spot levels um, after the two uh, break, broadleaf break crops. So, the main crop we've been growing as a brown manure is uh, field peas, Morgan field peas. Um, there's a photo showing uh, Morgan field peas direct zero tilled into, uh, into a, a, a uh, cereal stubble. Um, that shows a photo of what they look like when they're sprayed out in September. We're spraying them out in early September, or early mid September before the grass weed sets seed. So we're left with a mulch of 
of uh, Peace Double. Uh, they're generally uh, sprayed with uh, a double knock to uh, make sure that uh, nothing actually survives. And then we're zero tilling canola into that Peace Double the following year. The economics of it, um, I've actually looked at two different systems. The continuous cropping of wheat and canola only, and continuous cropping of wheat, uh, continuous cropping, but including brown manure on 25 per cent of, of the area. And the, the rotation that we're actually looking at, the sequence actually that we've uh, adopted now is field peas, canola, wheat and feed barley. So 25 per cent of the area is actually in, in brown legume. The experiences with the brown legumes has been that when we look at actually the farm average yields, looking at 25 to 30 per cent yield increases of both canola and wheat, crops grown in the two years after the brown manure crop. And the wheat crops after the peas, canola or the peas, wheat, have also shown elevated grain protein levels as well as the higher yields. In these, uh, this modelling that I've done on using actual farm data on costs and returns from clients, I've actually used 20 per cent yield increase. One of the problems I have in doing this is that all of my clients are expanding so nothing actually stays still for very long. So it's very hard to actually compare um, you know, one year to, to another because invariably two years down the track there's actually more country being operated. In fact one of my clients um, after actually adopting this system for two or three years decided that because of the less workload they could actually handle another 25 per cent of the area. So they had been cropping 4,000 hectares, two brothers. They decided they could actually, with the same resources, they could actually crop 5,000 hectares. So last year they went out and leased another 1,000 hectares. And they're doing very few, very few more tractor hours, etc. And the, those that they do do are actually outside the time at which they're spending time on the actual cash crops. So they're able to expand their total crop area by 25% with very little extra work. So I've looked at a typical 1,600 hectare property um, in, in um, northeast Riverina, um, and, and not in this system here, uh, going on on farm data, we have uh, looking at an average wheat yield of one, the three tonne a hectare and canola at 1.35, and the prices I've used at a uh, local silo level of 450 for canola and 220 for wheat. This is basically. In a lot of this, this system, flat to, get, um, flat to get any H2 wheat here at these sort of yields, most of the wheat's ASW and some of it's APW. Under this system, uh, with a 20% increase in yields, uh, we're actually getting quite a bit of APW wheat and, and well, predominantly APW with some H2 wheat, so we're actually getting a higher average return on the wheat. And uh, the canola is the same uh, and feed barley. So this, this business is actually run by two family labour units um, with an allowance of $100,000 a year for family labour. The capital tied up in the farm, um, looking at the value of this typical country is about $1,300 an acre. Uh, the plant, somewhere under a mill, uh, some people have more than this, but this is what I reckon is, is a realistic sort of figure. There's about nearly 4,000 tonnes of crop being harvested in this, this system, where there's about three and a half here. And because this is uh, primarily wheat, there's a requirement for more harvest and bin capacity here because of the, the window of harvest. So there's more, more header and uh, bin capacity here, slightly higher capital in plant. The working capital required under this system is 420,000, this is 535,000. So in total, there's 50,000 more here, and there's 115 here, so there's 165,000 more capital required to actually operate this business uh, under this production system compared with this production system. Okay, when we look at the trading results, 
Um, we can see here the income is, is obviously significantly uh, greater under the continuous crop, but, but so, are the, so are the costs. But in this situation here, EBIT, which is the measure of profitability, it's um, earnings before interest and tax, so we can actually compare businesses. It's what um, most businesses um, in uh, other businesses, that sort of agriculture actually, uh, how they measure their profitability is, is through EBIT. Um, so you can see there's about $16,000 actually more, the EBIT is actually higher here in profitability at, at, on these figures than the, than the brown manure system. But there's more money being outlaid to actually obtain that. So there's more risk, which is actually measured by EBIT margin. So what this says here is that you need to spend $72 to make $100 here, whereas here you only need to spend 69. It doesn't seem that much, but over 4,000 hectares it actually adds up to, adds up to quite a bit. That, that's a measure of risk. The return on capital here is a bit higher. Again, the classic risk reward equation. Higher potential returns, higher risk. When we actually look at cash, because cash is king, we see that, and I've taken into account interest on working capital here to fund this extra working capital to actually fund the year's operations, you can see that the, the, the difference here comes back to only about 6,500 because the 115,000 in working capital when you add some working cap add some interest to that and that accumulates during the year, um, that adds up so the margin actually comes down to about six thousand there. So that laying before harvest, another hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars you've got hanging out there after all you put your inputs in, um, which is at risk until the harvest comes in to make an extra six and a half thousand here. That's at that's at that uh, fertiliser prices that I did in early January when I prepared this, uh, where MAP and urea prices were actually pretty low, what clients were buying at that period of time, they've actually jumped quite significantly since then, about $100 a tonne. And of course these figures are, are um, um, subject to variation with all sorts of things, including, including fertiliser prices. But under this system, there's um, there's 150 more tonnes of fertiliser per annum used under this system on this 1,600 hectare property than there is on this. So $100 a tonne in fertiliser is $15,000. So that basically the previous on the EBIT, which was 16,000 higher in favour of the continuous crop, if fertiliser prices go up $100 a tonne, that basically wipes out the difference in the EBIT and increases the working capital required because another $15,000 has to be funded during the year before you get to harvest. And looking at the, the chemical costs of, of this system, uh, the chemical costs of this system average in my analysis here $55 a hectare, but a lot of people are spending $70 or $80 a hectare on chemical. I've been actually trying to get, my target here has been to get clients average chemical use down under $40 a hectare, um, which is about what this, um, what this represents there. So we've got significant differences in here. We bring this back to a per hectare basis, looking at about $100 a hectare for fertiliser under this system, compared with about 50 here, and looking at 55, up to 70, $80 a hectare here for herbicides uh, and fungicides. And, and here we're looking at sort of 40 to $50 a hectare. So we're looking at considerably less risk. Okay, so what happens in a, what happens in a dry year? Uh, when the spring fails or we get a frost like last year? When the prospects prior to that have been looking good and people went to town and spent money last year on, on crops and then it failed at the end. People have this perception that you make all your money in the good years. My experience has been that 
the difference between the good operators and the not so good operators is how much you don't lose in the, in the bad years, in those lower yielding years. So I don't subscribe to the popular theory that you have to go for broke in the good years because that's they're the years you make you make money. My experience is that people actually have a sound business model, a prudent uh, business model with an appropriate risk profile. They make money nearly every year. So when we look at the figures for uh, what I've assumed is reduce the yields by a third. So under this system, the wheat yields come down to a tonne a hectare, canola 0.45 but shown a corresponding increase in prices. And likewise with uh, this system, increase in prices corresponding with a reduction in yield. And what do we see? We see that the difference between the cash deficit for this system is about 72,000 higher than the brown manure system. And we're actually already carrying an extra 115 or 120,000 in the overdraft or in working capital actually before harvest. So we're starting next year, the second year, we're starting with minus 72 and then assuming we run the same program again, we need another 115, 120,000 to actually fund the next year's crop. There'll be some savings obviously after those yields in terms of fertiliser in terms of if you're operating a replacement policy, but those will be pretty similar. So what happens in the next year is that the difference in the potential working capital in year two is of the order of about 180,000. So when you add interest to that, accumulating interest and looking at what your peak operating debt is prior to harvest with accumulated interest on that, you're looking at pretty close to sort of $200,000 that potentially gets capitalised into longer term debt if this year doesn't come off. So we're looking at considerable, my focus is actually on risk. Not maximising returns, but looking at appropriate acceptable returns, going back to basics with the inputs to actually mod moderate the risk. So in conclusion, I believe a crop production system comprising brown manure, legumes, canola and wheat can be as profitable as continuous cropping, but with less production and financial risk. It's considered to be more resilient in dry years. I was only reading yesterday's Fin Review, um, an article by, um, what's his name, Mitchell, um, Peter Mitchell, not Peter Mitchell, I can't remember his name, sorry, he's a writer in the, um, in the Fin Review. And he was quoting the 2009 Productivity Commission report on farmers' ability to survive drought because, as you know, there's been a bit of publicity in the press recently uh, about what government should do about uh, farmers and drought. And the Productivity Commission's conclusions about farmers' ability to survive drought was very closely linked to farm productivity, farm scale and their ability to survive a drought. Now their ability to survive a drought is obviously closely linked with their productivity and their scale. Their scale is a large driver of costs, particularly fixed costs. But if they don't, if they're out of, if the risk is too high, the business model risk is too high, well then they don't survive, can't survive the drought. I believe this model is very resilient in the dry years, as I've demonstrated, and does give businesses the better ability to actually handle a dry finish or a frost as we had last year and uh, compared with the continuous cropping which is high risk. I believe it's more sustainable due to reliance, reduced reliance on selective herbicides and artificial nitrogen. I don't believe that we can adopt the widget factory model where you just keep on buying more inputs. Uh, to stay out of jail. At some stage, when you actually look at a biological system, um, I just don't believe it's sustainable. We just keep on buying inputs to try and actually uh, bridge the gap. I mean, as you've seen, we're seeing declining yields, flat out maintaining protein. I think that's an indicator that it's not sustainable. 
and my work has shown that it can produce acceptable financial results with a lower risk profile. Thank you.